Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson. Our special guest today is Bill Salas. He is an expert uh, in really Middle Eastern prophecy. Well, thanks. It's good to be back on the show again. Well, we are talking about some of your newest work and research the now prophecies. And I might just tell viewers who maybe didn't catch that first uh, segment with us, you are distinguishing between the now prophecies, which we believe are imminent and can happen at any moment. And there's a multitude of these. And that's what we'll be examining in this show. So stay tuned. But they are distinguished from the next prophecies, which are things on the prophetic horizon that have preconditions. So they couldn't happen in this instant, but they could happen pretty quickly once God began to assemble these pieces. And then what Bill is calling the last prophecies, that are the things that are the final setup for the return of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Right, right. And, you know, all the prophecies are converging right now. You know, one of the signs of the end times that we're deep into the end times is that all the end time signs are converging upon one another. But they will happen in a sequence. And we can kind of, from the details of the prophecy, sort of know chronologically how mm-hmm. those things would order themselves. So of most concern to any given generation throughout time, especially this one, is what could happen to that generation, right, in their lifetime. That's the information God wanted them to uncover and discern and reveal. You know, when Daniel was given prophecies, uh, we find out that there was some prophecies that were not for his time in Daniel chapter 12. Mm -hmm. And Daniel was kind of beside himself and he was wanting to understand them. And God said, you know, seal that vision up because it's for the time of the end when knowledge will increase and people will travel to and fro. Um, So, you know, but those prophecies were not relevant necessarily to Daniel, but they're becoming more and more relevant to our time Indeed. and that sort of thing. So that's what we're just trying to discover and discern. Uh, and the Now Prophecies book and DVD, which you guys are offering here, is written in a format that's easy to understand. I, I'm, just not, I'm not trying to appeal to the scholar and the elite person alone. Right. Bible prophecies for every man, woman, and child because God loves everyone and he wants them to know the information they need to know to prepare for what's ahead of them. Well, I think uh, we need to be with that word on our tongues and ready to share it because as these events are unfolding and all eyes are centered, except for the Americans who are looking at our presidential race, all eyes are centered on the Middle East because it's impacting Europe in incredible ways with the immigrants who are fleeing. It's obviously impacting the volatility. It does impact us in America through the oil prices. Uh, We just really are seeing God put his hand down in that region of the world where Jesus is literally and physically going to return. Absolutely, and a lot of the prophecies are Middle East centered, the unfulfilled prophecies, some of the now prophecies. But we need to remember that the end times Bible prophecies are so important that they will globally impact everybody. You know, right. They're not just gonna confine themselves to Damascus or Israel and that sort of thing. We are a globally connected planet at this point in time. Indeed. And, and we're gonna continue to be more and more networked along those lines. So uh, these are the prophecies we need to be thinking about that will affect everybody. So I agree with you, even though it's the Middle East, we need to not say, hey, that's over there and have a deaf and dear foreign policy. It's gonna come over here. It already is, 911. San Bernardino in California had the terrorist attack just a few months back. And so, no, I agree with you. We need to be on the alert for these prophecies, even here in America. You, you probably heard when James Clapper told a uh, intelligence briefing that he thinks that within 2016 that uh, ISIS will make an attack within our shores. Yeah, so. very much. And, you know, we're not talking probably lone wolf attacks anymore. Right. You know, Coordinated. Uh, yeah, they're, you know, they're sitting around figuring out ways they can bring a lot of harm on a corporate level to the Western world. And, of course, America is right at the top of the hit list for them. Well, Bill, you have a, uh, a number of now prophecies. And, again, these are things that could happen at any moment. We probably in this program don't have time to go over all of them. Uh, of course, they're thoroughly covered in the book and the DVD, but let's let's talk about ones that you think are uh, maybe most pertinent or of interest to our viewers. Okay, yeah, and, and I'm going to kind of list them, and then I'll kind of take a few of them. Maybe we can go back and forth sure. with the scriptures and look at them. Uh, I'm going to sequence them in the order I think they're going to happen. Uh, of course, this is a little bit speculative. Yeah. But I'm, the first thing I'm looking at is the disaster in Iran in Jeremiah chapter 49 on dealing with Elam. Then I'm looking at, Uh, the destruction of Damascus in Isaiah 17. I think it also picks up in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 23 through 27. I'm looking at the the trembling and toppling of Jordan in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 6. I'm looking at the terrorization of Egypt in Isaiah 19, verses 1 through 18. I'm looking at the final concluding Arab-Israeli war in Psalm 83. I'm looking at the decline of America, and I believe that's in... 
in Scripture, but also the historical and biblical precedent of what we've seen going on in the world and with we America. Will, we will do a whole show on that. Yes, because that, that well, of course, I mean, you'll we're want to a, catch that, folks. We're in a serious doldrum right now with what's going on. That's what you're talking about. Everybody's, yeah. The table talk is who's going to be our redeeming president coming up here real soon. But continue your sequence after the uh, American decline. Uh, then we've got the vanishing of the Christians, ah, the rapture. The vanishing point. Yeah, and that's the one that we don't know. That could happen at the first of the list or uh -huh. the middle of the list or whatever. And, you know, when we talk about the next prophecies that have some preconditions, they need the nows to be completed before the next can find their fulfillment. Uh, the rapture, some of the next prophecies are actually could be pre-tribulation prophecies too. And, you know, we on the set here, and I know you as well, believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. So the rapture could happen as a now prophecy. We need to be looking at it. It's imminent. imminent. It's a signless event. It could happen at any given moment right but if the lord tarries it could happen a little bit into the next realm but it won't happen into the last realm which is tribulation events and stuff like that and i give reasons why i, I support the pre-trib argument in the book in the chapter called the vanishing of the christians and uh, so i really invite them to under to get the book as for all the understanding of the deeper richer understanding of what we're talking about indeed indeed well which one of those would you like to uh, maybe elaborate on i do want to talk about reasons for the pre-trib uh, briefly, but we can hold that for uh, you know the end of the program or do okay that now whatever we you can want. do that. We touched upon that a little bit before, but um, there's a lot of ground to cover we didn't get to, and I would like to go through some of the reasons for the preacher rapture. But before we do, um, let's get into um, first of all. I think the thing I'm watching for next could happen real soon is uh, the disaster in Elam, disaster in Iran, the nuclear deal that recently was consummated with Iran and the Western world uh, was in July of 2015 is a really bad deal. No and doubt. I think from <laughs> the Lord's perspective, he's fiercely angry with this deal. And there's a vastly overlooked prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 34 through 39, dealing with ancient Elam, and it's dealing with Iran. Most people, when they talk about Iran, they're thinking about Persia and Ezekiel 38. You know, there's a lot written about Persia in Ezekiel uh -huh. 38, verse 5. But... Elam hugs the Persian Gulf. It's where the Bashar nuclear reactor is. And this prophecy talks about the Lord being fiercely angry with the leadership of Iran. And I believe the Lord is fiercely angry with the leadership of Iran right now. They want to destroy the Israel. They are persecuting Christians. They are trying to spread their, their Islamic theology throughout the world. So he's fiercely angry with them right now. We know that he's fiercely angry with them because it says he's going to destroy from the other kings and the princes. Uh -huh. That means that's bad leadership. Why? Because they want to launch something lethal somewhere. Says he's going to break their bow at the foremost of their might, so they can't launch something lethal somewhere. When this happens, the bow is broken. A disaster occurs, we're told in the prophecy. Uh, it sounds nuclear, Kevin. Um, and it, it says that there'll be a human, humanit humanitarian crisis as the indigenous affected population disperses immediately into the nations of the world. They, they are testing their uh, missile launchers right now. They are, and they're getting the uh, S-300 missile defense system from Russia. Um, we're talking here uh, that from the time of this airing of this show. They should have those within a couple of months from the timing of this. Th those are very powerful missile defense systems that will pro be very preventative of Israel being able to strike. Yes, Israel will be able to strike Iran. Much but more difficult, though. Very difficult. And even the Israeli le leadership is acknowledging this. We're only speculating, but do you see Israel uh, trying to do something before those are in place, or do you have any, uh, any leanings? You know, we have to be careful to think, you know, this nuclear deal is 10 to 15-year window where we think Iran won't get a nuclear weapon, which I don't... I think they'll be trying to get it very soon. I don't but, believe it for a minute. Yeah, and, it, nor yeah. Does it, and Israel doesn't have the luxury of trusting no. the untrustworthy Iranian regime. But, nor um, the American president. Yeah, I, I don't think Israel's going to take 10 to 15 years. They're, they're, they're getting to a point where they have to act real soon. The whole Middle East is imploding around them. Mm -hmm. ISIS is burgeoning in. You know, I mean, they're building fences. On their fences. borders. Yeah, they're building fences, even around southern Jordan area, for terrorism in the Sinai. Bill, we, we visited the Holy Land, you know, last November, and as we went to the Golan Heights and looked at, we saw ISIS headquarters right within sight of Israel's border, and it was really a stone's throw away from the UN headquarters. Yeah. How ironic. Russia's in Syria now. I mean, you know, that's got all the people interested in Ezekiel 38 at the edge of their seat. Right. You know, how soon is that going to happen now? Rock, rock solid relationships with Russia and Iran, and they're both in Ezekiel 38. That's the next prophecy. Um, where God's going to make his holy name known in the midst of his people, Israel. That's the event. That's the big event that we're watching that's coming. 
I don't think it's ready to happen yet. It's the next prophecy because Israel still has to be dwelling securely without walls, bars, nor gates. But the now prophecies we're talking about, I believe, will segue into that. And that's if that's coming soon, how, how much sooner are these now prophecies about to happen? Well, how do you see this uh, Iran Elam prophecy playing out? Well, we're not told. It, it appears to be a war. It says that um, the sword will consume the Elamites, the Iranians. They'll be dismayed before their enemies. So it appears to be a war. It doesn't tell us who the enemies particularly are. We know that God's upset. We know that Israel is concerned. The international community is concerned because they're putting a peace deal together, you know, a nuclear deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so the Sunni Arabs are all upset, Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and all them. So they've got a menu of enemies, which is another reason why we know this prophecy could happen now. But um, I think Israel is going to strike them. Uh, I think Israel is going to strike. The, a strategic area to strike is the Alam area. And it, that Bushar nuclear reactor is a nuclear disaster waiting to happen. And if they, this thing escalates into a pretty powerful war, you could actually have the fulfillment of that prophecy, which I think would then lead into the next now prophecy, uh, the destruction of Damascus in Isaiah 17, which many of your viewers have been studying that one now because a lot of people have been talking about Isaiah 17. Syria was such a closed, hidden country for uh, the last few decades, and we would read those prophecies and go, I, I don't see anything happening. But since this last year, Syria has exploded. It has, you know, I mean, it's it's almost a desolation right now, especially Homs, their third largest city. I mean, boy, you can barely even live in Homs right now. Aleppo is under siege, their number one city. Damascus is number two mm -hmm. as far as their overall population city. But, um, and a lot of people think, well, because Damascus is under such uh, desolation right now that this prophecy is finding fulfillment. Um, the prophecy starts, let, let's read, Probably three verses in Isaiah 17. Do you have it open to I that? I do, I do. Read verse 1 first so we can, they can understand the brevity of what we're talking about. All right, Isaiah 17, verse 1. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Okay, oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history, mm -hmm. capital of Syria, uh, is going to someday cease to even existing anymore. The Hebrew words, it will be reduced to rubble, a ruinous heap. So, you know, we're talking about an event that's probably going to happen. Again, it could happen at any given time for a couple reasons. Um, Syria has said that if Israel attacks them, which Israel has done four or five times over the last couple of years now, mm -hmm. they're trying to prevent Iran from getting weapons through Syria into Hezbollah's hands. Who's already, Hezbollah's already backed up to about 150,000 missiles. Estimates are that if the next war with Hezbollah that Israel is preparing for, Hezbollah will lob about 1,500 missiles a day into Israel. That's a big problem. Yeah, so, you know, Syria said, if you attack us, that we'll attack Tel Aviv, we'll attack Israel. They haven't done that yet. It hasn't been a good idea for them to retaliate back against Israel, who has attacked Syria. But Israel's response was, if you do that, we'll attack Damascus. Now, read Isaiah 17, verse 9, and I'll tell you why that's an important statement. In that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. See, that's that is where you have the important verse that talks about who's responsible for the destruction of Damascus. And not only Damascus, it says, in that day his strong cities, Damascus and Damascus and Pronan are his strong cities. So other cities, too, will be under siege, under war. But it says it, it will be the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. So we realize here that Israel will someday destroy the, the city of Damascus. It'll happen. Read verse 14 so we can talk about how suddenly it happens. And behold, at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. Okay, which tells us that in self-defense, in retaliation, from those that spoil and rot them or plunder them and other translations. Them being Israel. Yeah, that Syria is guilty of doing that to Israel. So Israel's not the aggressor, they're the retaliator. Mm -hmm. They will take out Damascus overnight because you see Damascus one evening and you don't see it the next morning. And you see this as a now prophecy. Oh, I do, happened. I do. There's nothing standing in the way of it. Yeah. You know, Syria is still at war with Israel. They never signed a peace treaty with, treaty with Israel. They've threatened to attack Tel Aviv if Israel attacks Syria. Israel's been attacking Syria. Um, again, this is another now prophecy. And if, if Israel strikes Iran's nuclear program, Syria, currently under the Bashar al-Assad regime, who is a proxy of Iran, mm -hmm. 
uh, they, Iran will call on Hezbollah, Syria, Hamas, uh, to come against Israel. I, I don't see Israel taking one for the team. Excuse me, Iran taking one for the team going, uh, no, don't go against Israel, even though they just took out our nuclear plan or whatever the case may be. No, it, you're going to have a biblical war, I think, come out of that. Well, let's continue on some of the now prophecies that you're most interested in discussing on our show. Okay, we've got a, we've got about three or four left. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. I'm gonna, and I think we're gonna save a show to just to pretty much devote most of that to the decline of America. Right. I'm very concerned about America right now. Um, but so the le- the last two we'll talk about. We'll briefly talk about the final era of Israeli war, Psalm 83, mm-hmm. and then the vanishing of the Christians, very i.e., good. the rapture. Yeah. Psalm 83. Um, 18 verses written 3,000 years ago, a prophecy, also a prayer, but also a prophecy written by Asaph, who was a prophet, we're told, in First Chronicles, uh, Second Chronicles 29.30 or First Chronicles 29.30. And it's dealing with a concluding Arab-Israeli war. We have a confederacy spoken about by Asaph, the psalmist. They're going to come together to form a plan to destroy the nation of Israel that the name of Israel may be remembered no, no more. more. And it lists who they are in verses 6 through 8. Verses 9 through 11 talks about how they'll be destroyed. I get into all this in the book. By the way, this book, the Psalm 83 Missing Prophecy Reveal book, is offered through Prophecy in the News. It was the best-selling book, I understand, in the 30, 40-year history of Prophecy in the News. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on explaining it. We've done shows on it before. But what we're talking about in that prophecy is a very big deal. That is the prophecy that would enable Israel, the Israeli Defense Forces, I point out, will be the tool used by God, the existing fulfillment of Bible prophecy, to finally defeat their Arab foes that share common borders with them in Psalm 83, which would be Lebanon, where you have Hezbollah, Syria and Iraq, where you have ISIS, Jordan, the Palestinian refugees, the Palestinians, the Hamas out of the Gaza. I believe we've got Egypt involved and Saudi Arabia involved. None of these are involved in Ezekiel 38. That's an entirely different band of enemies. Um, so this prophecy I'm watching for, it could happen really, really soon. Um, and therefore, you know, w- that would then set the stage where Israel could dwell securely. Right. And that's a prerequisite for Ezekiel 38 to happen. And Ezekiel 38 is a critical prophecy. God is going to uphold his holy name through that prophecy. We're getting really close to it. I'm excited about that. We may not be here for that because of the rapture, because that's all about Israel in that point in time. But so Psalm 83, if your listeners are not familiar with, your viewers are not familiar with that prophecy, it's in the book, the DVD, it's in your other books you've got here on Psalm 83. And open up the Bible to Psalm 83. Those, verse, those 18 verses I think are relevant for right now. They're very relevant as you read about the vow to wipe Israel off the map. Mm-hmm. Remember them no more. Yeah, cut them off that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. They want another Arab state. They want to call it Palestine. Exactly. Well, that leaves us with the vanishing of the church, the rapture. And in the little time we have left, uh, I think it would be good again to revisit uh, why you and I both uh, are convinced. uh, And we can't be 100% dogmatic, but we're we're firmly standing on good reasons to believe that the church will be ushered out and caught up before the tribulation and some of these worst things begin to happen. Read first. I'm going to talk about this for a minute. Would you read 1 Thessalonians 4? You know, what we're talking about when we talk about the rapture, I know most of your viewers are very familiar with this. This is a, the, the blessed hope, the, the glorious appearing of, of Christ. And for his bride, Christ is pictured as the bridegroom. His believers are pictured as the bride herself. He's going to come fetch her in the rapture. Read that to them so we'll we can do. briefly explain it to them and acquaint them with why that's very relevant for right now. Okay, this is Paul's letter to the Thessalonians and it says in chapter 4, Verse 13, that he doesn't want us to be ignorant. (laughs) That's good, isn't it? (laughs) Nobody wants to be ignorant. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, those who have died in Christ, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, then also them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, and this is the moment of the rapture, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 
so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the question is, to your viewers, do you believe that Jesus died and rose from the grave? Because that's what Paul's asking there. Absolutely. For us who do believe that, we have this hope. And in verse 18, it says we are to comfort one another with these words. Mm -hmm. This is a message of comfort. Jesus is coming to fetch his bride. The dead in Christ, those who had believed in Jesus and, but died in their lifetime, they will be caught up. We who are alive and remain will also be caught up. So this is, this is the amazing miracle that's going to catch the world without notice, without warning. 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about it happens in the twinkling of an eye. And yeah. what I like about that, Kevin, is that Jesus has been waiting for about 2,000 years now for his Father in heaven to say, go get your bride's son. And when he gets that command, he is going to get her and a split second won't even stand between our union. That's exactly. how much he loves and longs and yearns to have his bride. But he's patiently waiting. We're told in John 14 he's been building mansions, places, preparing places for his bride. It's all part of the Jewish wedding model. He, you know, the bride would... Would, uh, there'd be the betrothal, he'd pay a price for his bride, then he'd go away to prepare his place for the bride. That's what he's doing right now. He's preparing his place for us. And, and when he would come and fetch his bride, there would be a little bit of noise and clamor. The bride didn't know exactly when he was coming. And he would bring his friends with him, and it tells us there'll be the shout of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet. It'll be festive. It's exciting. And then he's going to take us to these places. Amen. And, and, that's, and I believe that's going to happen before the tribulation for various reasons. One, in uh, Romans 5, 9, we're saved from the wrath of the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, we're delivered from the wrath. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, we're not appointed to the wrath. Revelation 3, 10, we're kept from the hour of trial that comes upon the earth that would also be dealing with the wrath during the tribulation. At some point, God is going to judge this Christ-rejecting world, Kevin, and he's going to pour his wrath out upon it. Um, one of the arguments you and I were talking about for a pre-trib rapture is uh, the book of Revelation. Chapters 2 and 3 have seven letters written to seven churches. They had multiple applications. There were seven literal churches at the time. John wrote a couple thousand years ago in Asia Minor. Uh, during a, throughout the church age, you could find different types of those churches throughout any given point of the church age. And, but real importantly to us right now, especially on Prophecy in the News, was the fact that it outlaid a prophetic outline of the church age. Yes. Okay. And at this point, we're pretty much out toward the end of it right now. And then in Revelation 4 and 5, it starts with, after these things, metatauta, the, the Greek word, he says to John, John says metatauta, and it says, come up here. And John comes up into heaven, and he sees what's going on in heaven as a picture of the church. You see there's 24 elders up there that are redeemed from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So we're looking at a picture of the church in heaven. So the church is on earth in Revelation 2 and 3. The church is in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5. And what do we see in Revelation 5? There's a scroll. And the Lamb shows up as though he was slain, Jesus Christ. Yes. And he will, he will open the scroll. And we have the horsemen of the apocalypse. We have the six seals open up in Revelation chapter 6. And the very first seal is the Antichrist. So we're in heaven when the, the scroll is open. We're not on earth. We're already caught up. And then the Antichrist comes on the scene. And it's the, the Antichrist is an important figure in starting the tribulation because it's the confirmation of a false covenant, Daniel 9, that starts Daniel's 70th week, i.e. The, the tribulation, seven years of tribulation. So it's not the rapture that starts that. It's the confirmation of the false covenant. And where are we? We're in heaven watching Jesus open the scroll. Amen. 70th week, i.e. The, the tribulation, seven years of tribulation. So it's not the rapture that starts that. It's the confirmation of the false covenant. And where are we? We're in heaven watching Jesus open the scroll. Amen.